Wstań. 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 Катюша, что это? Что это? Стол, хорошо. Что это? Есть. Что это? Стул. Стул, да. Стул. Children with minimal sight, like these middle school children, have been building up a vocabulary of standard Russian sign language over the last few years. The teaching is, as always, kept practical. They're motivated by focusing on everyday activities and needs. In addition to whole word hand signs, the children are also taught how to build up words from individual letters. Different finger positions correspond to different letters, and sequences of these complete the word. They may never speak or hear these letters and words, but through finger movements or dactylography, they can represent any word, anything, activity or thought with their fingers. But these techniques aren't limited to those with residual sight. Letters and concepts formed with a single hand can be seen and they can also be felt. With dactylography and braille, deaf-blind children can have access to the conventional curriculum. Like Sveta, Nadia and Viera were born with a little sight and hearing, but since their first birthday they've been totally deaf and blind. Classification of domestic and wild animals is part of many children's curriculum. These tactile language systems allow the twins access to a normal education, both through reading and through direct tuition and discussion. The questions from the teacher pass through Nadia, the twin in the middle, to her sister. It's unclear if this different tactile language system has any consequences for the way they think. However, they certainly show signs of apparently normal reading habits, the tactile version of reading aloud, perhaps. It can be assumed by hearing people that dactylography is too slow for effective communication, but it's the twins' teachers who find it impossible to keep up. Like teachers everywhere, the teachers at Zagorsk recognize that reading alone has its limitations. Children need to understand what they're reading about. This is particularly important for children with such restricted access to exploring the world. How could they know what these animals are really like without seeing them? Plastic models can give only an impression of a real pig. The school can't provide relevant tactile experience for every lesson, but when it can, it is a powerful and effective learning experience. The twins have had very little direct contact with any animals. All that Vera and Nadia previously knew about pigs came only from books or the small, smooth, odorless plastic models. What did they make of the real thing? <laughs> It is important to understand what images deaf-blind children, totally deaf-blind children, have in their minds. The best way is modeling. This is a very old method used in teaching blind people. Sakalansky set great store by it. It's the unique way to understanding the mind of the deaf and blind. Modeling is ideally suited to act as a shared medium between the deaf-blind children and their teachers. 
The twins' tactile skills give shape and form to their mental images. There are clearly limitations to how much learning can be supported and monitored in such a concrete and practical way. And to the sighted and hearing, it may seem impossible for children like Nadia and Viera to make progress beyond a fairly modest education. However, in 1977, four of the school's first pupils graduated from Moscow University. The early pressures to demonstrate a case for the possibilities of educating deaf-blind children have eased. The school is continually reviewing, developing and broadening the curriculum. Not so much a music lesson for these deaf children as an experience of rhythm, pace and collaborative working. The purely academic is giving way to wider concerns. It's increasingly recognized that children placed in a residential school, away from their families, need more than a good formal education. Social and emotional development are increasingly a focus of interest to the teachers and psychologists. The regular school concerts are an opportunity for the whole school community to gather together. The candle dance, while a Russian tradition, is also just the kind of thing that might engage those with limited vision. These social events are an enjoyable and important part of the children's lives, as the engaged attention and enthusiastically signed applause shows. <laughs> this regular communal concert is only one of the ways in which the school seeks to provide and support the kinds of social experiences enjoyed by other children. The new focus on the social and emotional life of the children is not accidental. It is entirely in line with the original theoretical framework developed by Vygotsky and Sokolyansky. A framework that never made a simple distinction between the emotional and intellectual aspects of children's development. Well, Vygotsky used to say that emotional and intellectual development, they're actually a united structure. It's impossible to distinguish one from the other. And the main change in our approach is that we now should pay more attention, not just to the children's cognitive development, but also to the development of their personalities. The ideas of the early Soviet psychologists can be seen today, reflected in many of the activities of the teachers and the children. Whether the current or future successes of the school should be attributed to the pioneer Soviet psychologists like Vygotsky and Sokolyansky is difficult to tell, and in many ways is perhaps no longer important. What is still important, what must be a major influence on their success is that fundamental educational optimism. I'm absolutely convinced that it is possible to help any child with any sort of deprivation. I think it is impossible ever to speak about the limits of education when you start educating a child. This is the main principle of education, the belief in its possibilities, the belief, the faith that we can do something for a child. We should, we must find a way of doing it. I think that's the main thing. <laughs>